midst of a global pandemic. Uh, here you are, brand new on the tour, and you go out and you win the PGA Championship. What was that like? It's one of the best feelings in the world. To win a major, that's what kind of defines people. That's what defines a lot of careers, changes their careers. Um, but the biggest thing I've learned is that it's not supposed to change me. You know, I'm still true to myself. I'm still who I am. I'm still, you know, I'm a 24-year-old right now. But at 23, um, winning a major, you put yourself in a category that not a lot of guys have. What's life been like since then? Chaotic. Um, a lot more media obligations. A lot more time that you don't have um, when you were in college. Off weeks are short, but it's everything I love. This is part of what we do as a, as a professional athlete and as a golfer. It is very enjoyable to do. So last summer, we won the PGA Championship, and now this summer, you're headed to Tokyo to represent Team USA at the Olympics. How does that make you feel? Chills. It gets chills through my body when you, you, know, you say you're representing Team USA. I, I think it's something, as a little kid, you never thought being a golfer you'd, ever, you'd be able to do. But you're like, you know, golf is not in the Olympics. So once it happened four year, or five years ago now in Rio, um, you're like, maybe I'll have a chance for Paris in a few years after I turn pro. Uh, going to college at, at, at Cal, there's so many Olympic athletes already there and swimming that you know, I, I got to become really good friends with one of them that plays water polo. And he's like, what are your chances of making the Olympics? And this is right at graduation two years ago. And I was like, to be honest, it might be one of the hardest things to accomplish. You have to be top two in your country, if not top four in the US. And two years ago, um, obviously it's a goal, but you have to be realistic about yourself. As we sit here, you are the fourth best golfer in America, uh, number four on the tour. H how does our team look? What are our chances in Tokyo? I love them. I, I love it. You look at the, the roster of guys that we're going to have on our team, um, really strong, really young, but very strong. And I think that just kind of shows golf in general, not just in the U.S., but around the world that a lot younger guys like myself are coming out ready to turn pro and ready to make, you know, make a statement. What is it about the sport that, that you find so, so enjoyable, if, if not exhilarating? I seek perfection, and I think a lot of people do, but you can never perfect this game. There, there's never been a perfect round, yet we strive every day to try and do it. You know, we wake up every day not knowing where the golf ball is going to go. We wake up, our mind might be thinking about other things, but right when we step out on the tee, you have to be focused for not one hour, not two hours, but five hours. It's draining. So, you know, yes, it's not as physical as a lot of sports. Um, you don't have to be some size or weight, whatever, to compete. But that's what makes it great. Anyone can, can come play golf. Well, as someone who, who has tried to play for a number of years now, <laughs> not anyone can play golf. You can try. Yes, you can I can try. try. You know, I've always enjoyed the fact that I consider it a solitary sport, but you said something recently that caught my attention. You, you said, no, it's a, it's a team sport. What do you mean by that? I, I get the credit. Tiger Woods has gotten the credit. All these players, all these golfers have gotten credit, but it's not just us that get here. We have agents, coaches, family, sponsors. Um, there's so much more that goes into it. You know, you follow other sports and you talk about how important a coach is, how important hiring a coach is. It's, that's just as important to them as it is to us because, you know, if, if everyone's not on that same wavelength, wanting to reach for those goals, striving to be the best, um, you're going to have little hitches in there that, you know, you're not pushing yourself to, to your full potential. You mentioned Tiger Woods. Um, let's, let's talk Tiger for a second because perhaps you've heard uh, folks refer to Colin Morikawa as the next Tiger Woods. When, when you hear that, what do you think? I haven't. <laughs> yes, you have. I haven't. You've heard it. I haven't. No, um, I don't think it's a fair comparison for anyone. I think it's an honor to be ever categorized or talked about in the same manner. When you've reached a goal like winning the PGA at such a young age and you're in that group, or, you know, for me, turning pro and making my first 21, 22 cuts, being second to him, it means you're doing something right. I, I don't think when you're saying someone is going to be like someone else, that's not what we want to do. We want to become our own person. We want to create history and become our own self. And I think that's what everyone, the best athletes are known for, right? They have their legacies, not just in the sport, but what they do for the world. Um, and I think but when you are compared in those same categories or something that he's done, um, it's meaningful. It means you're on the right path. Yeah. 
When you said 21 or 22 cuts, I thought it was like 24 straight cuts. No, he had 25, I think. I think I had 22. It was, it was last year. Yeah. Was at, yeah, I was at Travelers. You were pretty close. Yeah, we were <laughs> close, but not close enough. Are, are we at all nervous about the Olympics going in, or do we treat it like just any other PGA Tour event? You know, I think anytime you're able to represent Team USA, and I've, I've only done it as an amateur, um, there adds that extra sense of nervousness, that extra sense of pressure, because you're, you're representing not just your team of your coaches and family, but you have an entire country. You know, you want to win gold. You want to come back with a medal, but you want to come back with gold. But that's what we thrive in. We thrive as athletes. At least I love being in those positions when you have those nerves, because we're able to channel those nervous kind of energy, those feelings into excitement. And that's what I love. I want to be in that spotlight. You want to be in those pressure situations. Recently watching, you know, Team USA swimming trials, those people have been training for five years now for possibly, you have a 50 meter freestyle race for 10 seconds of their life, right? 100 meter race down the track. It's amazing to me what kind of pressure that is versus kind of what we have done and, and how golf has evolved into the Olympics. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. I know you've been to Tokyo a couple of times. Have you ever played that course? I have not, no. Okay. Obviously, this is going to be an, an Olympics like no other. Uh, we are still, albeit on the back end, um, there's a global pandemic uh, that continues to, to ravage that part of the world, especially right now. Are you anxious at all about, about that aspect of it with regards to, to the coronavirus and being in Tokyo? You know, I, I think everyone's doing the right measures. Being on the PGA Tour was one of the first organizations, sports organizations, to really come out of this pandemic and start everything up as quick as possible. And I think they've done a great job. So I think everyone, at least I can speak hopefully golf-wise, um, with golf in the Olympics, I'm sure they reached out, and I know they reached out to all these leading organizations, PGA Tour, European Tour, all the tours around the world, to really figure out what is going to be safe and comfortable and allow us to go out there and play our best golf. Because for us, you know, yes, it's our job, we want to play great golf, but there's entertainment to it, right? People want to see on TV, whether they're there in person or not, they want to see some fireworks, they want to see some excitement. And I'm sure they're gonna do a great job. We've been traveling every week. We go through the right precautions of what we need to do. And by the time we're on the course, you know, since we started this pandemic, I haven't worried about anything else. All I've been focused on is golf. And I think that's gonna be the same way once I arrive. As you know, uh, no family, no friends going to be allowed to come and cheer you on. Does that change anything at all for you? You know, it sucks. There's that extra sense of uh, pride that you might get at a, at a regular Olympics. Um, but what's regular anymore? You know, we don't know. And you can't take away me being an Olympian and the memories I'm still gonna create with Team USA. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed and we could keep talking four years later down the road. But to say that I'm an Olympian at 24 for Team USA Golf, um, 
it's the best thing in the world. There's just so much excitement and, and there was no second thought for me about whether or not I would take this trip. It was, it was an absolute yes and, and you know, it was a great consolation prize to not really winning the US Open. Uh, yes, I guess that is quite the, <laughs> right. quite the consolation right. prize. Um, I, I hear that you, you're also a bit of a foodie. Yeah. Uh, Tokyo known for some of its amazing cuisine. Are you going to be able to, to take in some of the, uh, the sights and, and scenes there in Tokyo with regards to the food? I haven't read up on every single rule and regulation we have to go through yet, but you know, hearing from what I've seen and, and seeing all the stuff, um, it seems like we're gonna be in somewhat of a bubble. Hopefully we're able to just bring takeout or have someone deliver food because, you know, like you said, I, I've been to Tokyo twice and it was some of the best food I've ever had. It's one of my favorite places to go to in the world um, simply because of the food. I enjoyed the YouTube videos I saw of your adventures. <laughs> um, if this golf thing doesn't work out, I think you've got a, a future at the Travel Channel. Love it. You were born in California. Your mother's of Chinese descent. Uh, but your father, as I understand it, has uh, some Japanese heritage. What's it going to be like being in Tokyo, playing for Team USA, but at the same time uh, also remembering your, uh, your father's history there? I think since I've turned professional and going to Japan in 2019 to go play, I've embraced being an Asian American a lot more. I'm a third, fourth generation Asian American already. So it's not like we have a lot of relatives over there, but to see the love for the game in Japan and to see how they resonate with me and to see that simply because yes, I look like them, a little kid or whatever, sees that opportunity that they wanna be like me, um, knowing that I can give hope to hopefully just one person, hopefully more and more, it means a lot. You know, I think what I've realized over this past year especially is that Golf is what I do, and it's what I do pretty well at, um, but it's not what defines me. And I think there's so much more to life, and that's what I've realized from some of these best pros out here, is that uh, there's so much more that they love and care about, um, that this is only one outlet to help us kind of push what we love. I read that um, you can be a bit superstitious. Five T's <laughs> in the right pocket, is that right? It's not superstitious, what, what it's, is a, it? it's a routine. Okay. Superstitions are routines. Why five? Five is my favorite number. It always has been. You know I mean, this is starting to sound like a superstition. How, how did five become the favorite number? Any? There's no reason. Um, it's just growing up playing baseball, I always wore five. Um, you would think maybe my birthday's on the fifth, it's on the sixth. Uh, so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't add up, but five's a great number. Five's your number. Yeah. Um, is it true you have breakfast foods? Um, emblazoned on your wedges. I do, yeah. You said I was a foodie and I, I stick to that. Throughout college I had a bunch of different foods stamped on my wedges. Um, just continues to evolve. Are we changing the approach at all at the Olympics? Or are you going to be... I might. The, this breakfast cereal thing is, has become famous, especially since I won uh, the PGA with it. So I might stick with that, but I might add, have to add uh, some sushi or, or just local Japanese food onto it. I mean, I've done it for Hawaii when I've played over there. Your, your longtime girlfriend, Catherine, um, how has she helped you as a, as a golfer? Yeah, Kat's been amazing. I mean, we've been dating for over four years now and, and she understands golf, which is also great. You know, sometimes that's bad when I think the connection is too close within golf, but her being able to play professionally for a year, then kind of putting that aside to come out and just help me, um, she understands what I go through. What makes it great is that she doesn't care how I play. She could care less what I do out on the golf course. She wants to be there for me after. We can go have dinner. We can go talk about anything else other than golf. And I think that's what's great because she understands the struggles I might go through on a bad day. So she gets it that I want to think about anything other than golf. Um, she's the best thing in the world for me. As we look ahead to Tokyo, how are we, um, how are we defining success? Gold medal. Anything gold less medal. than a gold is? We're, we're out there to win. Yeah, I want my teammates to play well. I want Team USA to do really well. Um, but for myself, I want to win. I want to win gold. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Yeah. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yeah. Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers.
We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning to the expression, rise and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. This is amazing! Yes. Yes. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. All right, Grace and Kendall, your Team USA, you've got shirts on. Has it hit you yet that this is actually, this is happening now? We're doing it. I mean, it definitely took a while to set in because I think all throughout the selection process, everyone was just like, just got to make the team. And everyone was just trying to make it to June 3rd, which was the naming date. And then after June 3rd, when we figured out that we were on the team, it was like a week of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the Olympics. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the Olympics. Like now it's time to go. Like we gotta do the work and prepare. Give me some perspective for how long you have been rowing and out on this water. I mean, has it been since you were a little girl? I started as a junior in high school, which is a little late. Um, like if you're trying to be recruited normally, like your junior year is when you start doing the recruiting process. So. Um, I've been rowing for about 11 years. I'm not gonna say how many years I've been rowing. <laughs> Grace could be like but, my babysitter. But I want you to give us some perspective for people who don't know. To find out, you know, on June 3rd, when they say your name, that you're making the Olympic team, there's a whole journey that happens before you get to that point. So just tell me a little bit, and for people at home, the journey to get to where you are. So it's a unique sport in that you end up peaking in your late 20s, early 30s. And so our boat is around that age, and the three out of the four people in our four boat, this is their first Olympics. So I thought it was really cool seeing everyone else's reactions, because I'm not that I'd been there, done that. I was super excited, and I called like my mom and my fiance right away. Um, but it's just like everyone burst into tears, and it was just total excitement. How hard is it to make it to where you are? I can't even sum up into words the last like just the last two months, and the selection process was by far the hardest emotional and physical thing I've ever had to do in any other sport that I've been a part of. What does it entail? Uh, going as hard as you can every single piece thinking that you're the one that's gonna be switched next. Like your butt is on the line and you have to go as hard as you can every single piece, every single practice for like two weeks. Yeah. By the time that the team was named, I was all cried out at that point. I was like, <laughs> okay, I have no more tears. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. For you, so you were in Rio in 2016, right? You were tired. Why did you want to do this again? I kind of had to uh, take a temporary break in order to work and get some funds because rowing is not exactly the most lucrative career. <laughs> Yeah, but I came back, I finished fourth um, in Rio, so that was definitely a part of it, was coming back. And this women's four boat is the gender equalizer too. Um, and so that was pretty cool. I was like, it'd be amazing to be in that boat and have that opportunity to be a part of this historic moment. I saw your post on Instagram. For people who don't really understand, explain the significance of this moment. This is the first time ever that we've had gender equity between the men and the women at the Olympics for rowing. This is Tokyo, we're 2021 now, and and it's equal number of men and women, which is pretty incredible. I told you, as soon as we meet you guys, we fall in love with you guys, you have 
additional millions of fans watching and rooting for you. What should we know about the sport? Oh. Rowing is the only sport where you face the start line, you sit down, you go backwards, and go on repeat. Yep. And, and I'd you're, say sli you're just sliding back and forth on your butt. Yeah. <laughs> our job <laughs> is to sit on our butt and go backwards. You as make fast it sound so yeah, yeah, I know. You'll see soon. And where do you find the grit from when you're out on the water, you're exhausted, your muscles are like, please stop? A lot of it comes from being surrounded by these women. Like, I can't stop because me stopping affects my teammates and my teammates are relying on me. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this sport is that it is like the most, like the ultimate team sport. Like you can't be a beat off of anybody. You have to be moving with each other. You have to be going together in order for it to go as fast as possible. So. And when you get that moment together when you're in perfect synchrony, you hear little icicles under the water, you feel the boat flowing, and you feel the power. You can feel the muscles of people's legs pushing behind you. It's pretty incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. You should be a writer. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. So now, am I understanding this correctly? So the four of you haven't competed together. Well, in a way, we have competed Yeah, talk together. to me about that. Um, so this lineup was like one of the last lineups that we tried during the Olympic selection process. And I think it was, I don't know, we found the four people to make it the fastest. And we were like, yep, here we go. This is it. Yeah, and it was unique because normally we have World Cups, which are races where we're competing against the rest of the world. Um, but it was kind of closed off for us. So our team opted not to go just to be safe with um, COVID and the pandemic. And so we're kind of going in fresh, which I think is a really good advantage because our team, the, the US team, the hardest part of the Olympics is making the team. Yeah. So we have such a strong, deep team that competing against each other is like going to a World Cup every day. Yeah. Wow. And it's such an interesting dynamic that, I mean, I'm sure there are other sports that are like this too, but like, you're competing against your friends. Like for the last seat in the fork, I was competing against Molly Bruggeman and we've been friends and teammates since my first under 23 team back in 2014. And like ever since then, I was like, oh my God, I looked up to Molly so much. Like I just want to be like Molly, like she's a great rower. She's made all these boats. She's super fast. Like I just want to row and be like her. And then I, in a way, took her Olympic dream away because I beat her by the slimmest of margins. So it's, it's a really bittersweet feeling because you're happy for yourself that you are achieving your dream, but at the same time, there's so many other dreams of your teammates that have been training and doing the same exact work for so many years that they're not getting the same chance that you are. That's a very good way to put it. So then because of that, fast forward to being out on the water in Tokyo, it probably makes you want to just do it even more. Yeah. Yeah, we um, definitely have had pieces already, like after the team has been named, where we're calling power tens for everyone that's been a part of the training center this whole year. Because it's not just the four of us who are representing the US, it's the entire training squad. And so I think that gives us extra motivation, just everyone on the team, the power of all of that. 
And what does it feel like to be at the Olympics? You've been there before. Oh, it's pretty incredible. It's pretty <laughs> incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, down in Rio, um, so rowing competes first. So we didn't go to opening ceremonies. We were dressed up in our outfits, waiting for everything to happen. Um, just kind of sitting in our rooms, watching on TV, wow. <laughs> just like everyone else was. And we competed. And then afterward, we were able to watch all of the U.S. teams compete. And it was just so incredible. Go to like all of the sponsor houses and all of the other country houses. And it was just so cool. When kids are tiny, they talk about they're at the Olympics. So we're going to do this like, you know, we're going to be in the, you dream of this moment. So do you feel that when you're there and you see all of these different sports and you guys are all there together competing for the country? Yeah, it's kind of like you're like tapping on your TV screen, like, oh my God, Serena Williams, like in the elevator with me, are you real? <laughs> like, <laughs> let's take a selfie. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty cool. And what are you most looking forward to? I'm gonna try to do my best to like, just stay focused on the task at hand. And I know there's gonna be a lot of distractions, but I, this, I mean, we've heard this a billion times, but like this, our Olympic experience this time around is going to be extremely different from like Grace's experience in Rio and other Olympic games because we're only allowed to be in the village on the bus at the course on the bus in the village like we can't go outside like we have to leave 48 hours after our race is done and also everyone's going to be wearing masks so you're not going to like know who people are so in a way it'll help you keep like tunnel vision stay focused not to say that we're not going to have any fun, because I'm sure when you it's follow true. our true. Instagrams too, we're going to be doing behind the scenes of what it's actually like in the village. So I'm Ro Gracie on Instagram, and okay, Kendall yeah. has I was her like, Tell TikToks. Us. We, we'd yeah. love to cheer. Yeah. Are you kidding? TikTok was my quarantine hobby, I guess you could say. <laughs> I, mean, I definitely need to up my game to yeah. give the Olympic content to the people. So we're going to keep it fun and light, and then obviously focus on racing. Grace, if I were to ask you what the other three women bring to this team, what would you say? Uh, extreme fitness. Rowing is a power endurance sport. So these women um, have been training, building up strength and power. They have the highest VO2 maxes that are in our sport of rowing um, compared to all their athletes except Nordic skiing. Um, so they've got the power, they have the endurance, um, all of the grit. As Kendall said with the Olympic selection, that was definitely something that solidified our boat. And also just like lightheartedness. Like we have this really good dynamic in our boat where everyone's joking back and forth. We're extremely focused at the task on hand. But Claire, Maddie, Kendall, and myself, I think are all just, you know, here for having fun too. Yeah. We take ourselves seriously, but you can't take yourselves too seriously or else you're just going to be button heads. I yeah. can understand that. You got a good right. thing going. Do you feel good about it? I think our boat has a lot of potential. And the interesting thing, like Grace said earlier, there hasn't been, or there haven't been a lot of um, boats, like our competitors going to these World Cups that there usually are. So we really don't know what the competition is gonna look like. I mean, all we can do in the sport of rowing is like focus on your boat and making it go as fast as you can. Cause you, I have no, impact on the other lane unless somehow Grace decides to like steer on over there, which doesn't happen. Um, but like if we just focus on ourselves and making ourselves go as fast as we can, I think we can do really well. And your families, what do they think? It's actually really cool. The USOC has um, a party kind of thing for all family and friends down in Florida where people go down and they can watch. So I think that'll be really cool, but it's not gonna be the same as But Japan. they'll be together. But it'll be cool. And everyone will be able to watch. Yeah, my dad's been telling me about all these like t-shirts and lawn signs and viewing parties he's oh. organizing. I'm like, dad, I don't need this right they now. They have like, as many parent <laughs> Zoom meetings as we do practice. Anything else you want people to know? Um, I hope they enjoy watching rowing. It's a, it's a great sport. Not a lot of people pay attention to us outside of the Olympics but we have historically done very well. And I think hopefully we will continue to that legend that our, uh, the women before us have set.
We are getting ready to go, baby. Heading to Japan. Tokyo, here we come. Good morning from Tokyo. Today's home away from home. This is our Today Show Olympic workspace. Our writers, our producers, our crews. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Olympic headquarters overlooking the iconic Rainbow Bridge. We didn't pay the light bill, so they haven't turned the lights on yet. The Olympic rings aren't lit up yet, but guess what? I'm lit up. We're halfway through the first week of the Olympic Games, so we thought we'd give you, hey, look at that! Just like that! Bam! Oh, the power. Uh, we're gonna give you an inside look behind the scenes from how we get our show on the air each day to how the athletes prepare for the biggest competition of their lives. We're gonna introduce you to the teams working around the globe and around the clock, bringing you more than 7,000 hours of Olympic coverage all across NBC platforms, making the Tokyo Olympics the biggest media event of all time. This year, we all had one goal in mind, staying safe. Take a look at how we got here and how we're working to bring you the Olympics during this unprecedented time. Tokyo, here we come. Taking off for Tokyo, an event much anticipated by athletes, the audience, and even Today Show anchors. Okay, heading to Japan. Um, I'm dressed like the athletes. <laughs> I'm going to be wearing all red, white, and blue. It's not easy getting somewhere in the time of COVID. We've got all those safety precautions, and this is no exception. Well, we left Saturday at 1.30, and now we are 4.10, Tokyo time, and we are officially here at the game's big end. Tokyo, nearly 7,000 miles from New York City, and there are a lot of steps to go through before even getting on the ground. Testing at home, testing at the airport, checkpoints, lines, and more checkpoints. Making our way in line, getting it. We've got our OCHA stuff, and now it's checking out, I guess, more COVID stuff. Almost there. Almost so there. close. Never so close. Smooth sailing for Craig and our executive producer to get their COVID test results. Me, not so much. So your testing numbers come up on this board. Uh, uh, Craig's came up. Tom's came up about 10 minutes ago. I'm still waiting. We all went together. So this is the first hitch, at least for me. Oh, well. So far, what are you going to do? And a negative test result is required to enter. And so... I wait. All right, gentlemen. Well, I've uh, got to get another test, so boom. We'll see you guys later. Hopefully. Good luck, Al. All right. We'll see you at the hotel. We're with you. But finally, after four hours at the airport, <sighs> well, made it. At the hotel in Tokyo, and it is gorgeous. Where I still have to quarantine along with everybody else. For safety, we're broadcasting from our hotel, making it work and home all in one. Good morning from Tokyo, today's home away from home. There are ways to make quarantine fun. For example, Savannah using the time to work out in her room because we can't go to the gym or even really outside. The only times we are allowed out is for a 15 minute a day walk. Walking, walking, more walking. Though short, it is a chance to discover some treasures unique to Tokyo, like the endless vending machines. Japan has the most vending machines per capita, more than four million. Keir Simmons is out of quarantine and experiencing some more of what Japan has to offer. Al, my brother, when you get free from quarantine, you're literally gonna be able to breathe again by visiting ancient forests like this one. One thing you should note, the bears roam free here too. But we can't forget why we're really here, the games. And even though we've had to test and prepare for this, it's nothing compared to what these athletes have been working so hard for. Go Canada! Oda spending the day cheering on the women's gymnastics team as they brought home the silver medal in the team competition 
Oh my god, look who's here. Wait, look, look, look. Oh, she's going, go, go, go. go. Yeah. Yes! As the competition heats up in Tokyo, athletes swinging by our studio with their medals. And even though COVID has prevented the normal audiences from being in the stands, we all still cheer on our athletes and appreciate the hard work everyone's put in to making these games a reality. We're just getting started. Stick around for more never before seen behind, seen behind the scenes footage from here in Tokyo and how we actually get our broadcast on the air each morning. Plus later, Savannah will be joining us live. If the Today team had an Olympic sport, what would it be? Eating. That's right, we are world champion eaters. Okay, if today had an Olympic sport, there's only one sport it could be, okay? It takes precision, it takes brains, it takes finesse, and it takes drinking. Beer pong, okay? Beer pong, can you picture Roker? He dominate. beer pong. Today's show team had an Olympic sport. I think it would be speed walking, because we're always walking really fast from set to set, outside of the plaza, inside, up the stairs, down the stairs. That's really the only thing we're good at, athletically. <laughs> If the Today team had an Olympic sport, it would probably be talking, just yapping, because let's not kid ourselves, that's essentially what we do, right? Um, and no one does it better than Hoda Kotb and Savannah Guthrie. And my God, we've just been yapping nonstop for 40 years. So yeah, we take the gold and just run in our mouths. And welcome back. We're here live in Tokyo. I'm here with my friend Bob. Uh, we're giving you a behind the scenes look at how everyone here at NBC works to bring the Olympic Games to you at home. So how does the show get on the air? That's what I was wondering, Bob. Take a look. This is what you see at home. Welcome to today and welcome to Tokyo. It is great to have you with us on this Monday morning. Sweeping views of Tokyo Bay state-of-the-art Olympic venues. We got ushered off to the bus and then onto the village. Gold medal hopefuls roaming the athlete's village. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Yeah. We are gonna be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. 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 We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning, see the expression, eyes and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. We are gonna be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. 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 We've been watching Chanel bust a move all morning. New meaning, see the expression, eyes and shine. Jenna, nearly two miles in the air. Yes. Your Gampy would be so proud. Oh, thank you, Al. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Let's go back to the village. I was exhausted. But what you don't see is our village. Look at this! Wow! Meet the Today Show team responsible for producing a one-of-a-kind morning show in a one-of-a-kind year. 
in COVID times here in Tokyo, we have to be uh, really careful about how and when we shoot. We have special permission to shoot today at Sky Tree, but we had to come in before the general public came in. And can you tell we're just a little bit excited to be here? This is our Today Show workspace. We've got writers and producers all gathering everything that you see in the morning. It's sent to New York, cut together and put together in snippy little packages for your consumption. The biggest adjustment, the 13 hour time difference. Here in New York, we have shifted our schedule so we start later at night to match our team in Tokyo's hours. That way when they send back video, we can grab it and put it into our stories for the morning. It is uh, quarter to one right now. We still have a few more hours before air, luckily, so we have more time to put it together, but hope you guys We're are doing well. A few hours before we hit the airwaves. Can I get revised questions for some? Good morning, everybody. Hello, Team Tokyo. Maz, how we doing? We have our morning rundown meeting. The rundown is sort of the Bible of the show. It's the chapter and verse for what we're doing from top to bottom. It's the order, it's who's doing what, when they're doing it, and where they're doing it. And hopefully we stick to it, but a lot of times it changes all the way through the end of the show. So Matt, can you walk us through the first half hour? You guys, I got a rundown. You need a pronouncer, you need a pro now. <laughs> <laughs> After the rundown meeting, it's a complicated ballet between the Tokyo team and our New York control room. The biggest challenge is just the communication amongst everybody. You have producers over in Tokyo shooting stories. They're talking to producers back in New York who are editing them. They have to be on the same page. As far as the control room, it's here in New York. All the talent, the cameras, stage manager, they're in Tokyo. The stage manager acts more as a director for me since I can't be there. It's just a lot of coordination, a lot of communication to make sure everybody's on the same page. Once we get closer to that 7 a.m. start time, it's all hands on set. Hi. Over here, we've got our actual set. So uh, yes. you can see yes. this is where it all happens, right here. There's our set. There's our stage manager, Yosef. It's all happening right here for today, behind the scenes. In five, four, three. But even across 13 time zones and nearly 7,000 miles, our village comes together to wake you up with those same familiar smiles. Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to today. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday morning. So we're joined now by our executive producer, Tom Mazzarelli, better known uh, as Maz. Maz, good Hello. to see you. Hello, Al. How are you? I'm looking at you on camera. I didn't realize what a handsome man you are. It's, just stop lying. <laughs> stop lying. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of the big moments so far. 17-year-old swimmer uh, Lydia Jacoby winning the gold. Yep. Uh, Shocks Nation shows up on set for interviews. So how, how does this happen? How does she get from uh, winning that medal to getting here, here on the Today Show? Well, it's funny. I'm going to back you up even a little bit more. A couple weeks ago... Chanel did a profile of the teen swimmers on Team USA. Right. And there were like 10 or 11 of them. Mm -hmm. I think she did, and they were in Hawaii training. And I remember she did the piece, and one of the, one of the things that stuck out was this Lydia girl saying, I've never been able to swim in an Olympic-sized pool before. Where she lives in Alaska, yeah. it was not that size. And I'm like, how, does that even po how is that even possible she made the team? She must be amazing. Cut to, you know, three or four days ago, yeah. this girl wins it. And everyone's like, I remember thinking, that's the girl without the pool up in Alaska. Oh. So we say, we got to get her on. And there's this whole thing called managing victory, right? Mm -hmm. It's this whole system that we sort of NBC and the, Olympic, and, the, and the Olympics teams have set where they sort of go right from the pool to the mix zone, which is where they do the interviews right, right. afterwards. And then they start their, their, their interview process. And we are usually first. And the, mm -hmm. it sort of works with the clock that way. So we then end up. Getting her here, you've got to clear all the COVID protocols, right? You've got to mm -hmm. make sure that she's not sort of swimming again the next day and all right. these other things. And, you know, lo and behold, bang, Boom. she's here. There and she it was is. fantastic. In fact, we, uh, our viewers have been asking questions. we got Debbie on, on Instagram asking, how are you managing being on the air late at night when this is actually past our bedtimes? I kind of like it. Yeah? You like it? Yeah, right? it's yeah. not bad. Yeah. It really is. It's, for the most part, I mean, I like getting up in the morning mm -hmm. and sort of getting, I'm just so used to it, as right. are you. Um, I do like the idea of having the whole day to plan. Sure. Though. 
Like, you know, I, I'd say I'd rather have, like, we're on locally here at 8 p.m. Yeah. I'd say, like, a 5 o'clock or would it be, 4 o'clock would be perfect. Would be perfect. You, know, you can plan all you want, but this is, uh, we shine when there's breaking news. Yeah. Take me behind the scenes uh, when, when Simone Biles, yeah. you know, drops out. Yeah. Controlled chaos. The yeah. controlled chaos that was <laughs> yeah, that show. Exactly. Well, you know, one of the things that we, we, you know, going into these games, we knew that there would be events taking place live on our air, which is rare. That doesn't usually happen. Right. And it would be going through the 9, 9.30 hour. And so we're like, okay, this is good. That We're going to lean into this. Little did we know that this major news would happen. I think it happened at like 7.18 in yeah. the morning. So we just scrapped the rundown, changed everything happening at 7.30. And slowly but surely, we were learning information about Simone. It was an injury, and then it was not an injury, then it would involve some sort of focus or mental yeah. the health issue, and then all these things were playing out, and then all, then she, they competed. Right. They, the Russians win, we win the silver, then she speaks to Hoda after. That all happened within like a 90-minute window. Wow, and then we had to update for our West Coast affiliates yep. and all that. We were on them like midnight. Yeah, the other big breaking news yeah. is that um, as we now have a mascot, the Today and Show mascot. We've been waiting a very long time. I think there was... There was J. Fred Muggs, right. and now there's been a 60-year window that we need to fill. And so we've got our, our mascot head here, but you can see there's the mascot. We haven't named her yet, but this is the person behind the mascot, inside the mascot, I should say. Well, Phoebe Wiener, good to see you. Good to see you, Al. So, so how, did, how did you end up inside the costume? So a couple of weeks before I left, Evan Klupt, uh, the director of production management, started CCing me on these emails saying, I'm so sorry, dot, dot, dot. And there were some you know, markups of what the costume would look like, and I didn't really understand. And then slowly but surely, it became very clear that I would be wearing this when I got to Tokyo. And, and what, I'm, what amazes me is your mom called you after seeing the mascot and said, was that you in the mascot? Yes, I was a little bit embarrassed, and I didn't really want to tell people that it was me, but I think they kind of figured it out. Well, and I think I speak for Maz. Thank okay. you. Can I just interrupt for a second yes. and just say, Phoebe is an incredibly cultured Japanese scholar. That's right. A Fulbright Literally, scholar. Fulbright, a scholar. Fulbright scholar. Speaks Japanese, fluent. We brought her here for that. Bonus is she's a fantastic mascot. That's right. And uh, just remember the name, Phoebe Wiener. Uh, she'll be running NBC News in about, oh, five years. Exactly. Okay. I'm already packing my office, by the <laughs> way. There you go. That's why we're all being nice to Phoebe. Yes. She's going to be our boss. Phoebe, thanks, thanks, so, thanks so much. So Mez, thank you, thanks, bud. Al. When we come back, a look at it and how the athletes prepare to compete. Plus, Savannah Guthrie joining us live. Don't go away. What do I eat for breakfast? Here, I'm waking up at the same time, and so I'm having my, my usual breakfast of champions. Little tiny chocolate donuts. For breakfast, since I was a walking zombie, I grabbed whatever was closest at the buffet. So I think it was an omelet. I think I had bacon and some form of potatoes. Well, breakfast was dinner, so I ate a full-on honking plate. Um, I had eggs, salmon, toast. I ate with broken. What color were your eggs? Orange! Color yes! Orange. It's like they're like red, the eggs yeah. are funky. They taste good, but yeah. they're orange. And how was your, what'd you do well, for breakfast today? Well, I didn't today? eat breakfast. I don't usually, so then I had a Luna bar because we went over to swimming. I know, I'm still getting adjusted, so I'm not a breakfast person usually, but today I was. Welcome back to today's Olympic headquarters in Tokyo. We're pulling back the curtain, giving you an exclusive look at the Tokyo Games. And now it's time to see what goes on behind the scenes as the world's greatest athletes prepare to compete. Kalish is going to win gold for the United States, and Litherland is trying to make it a 1-2 finish for the Americans. Before the medals, the events. And that will get through. And here comes McClenney to try and win it, and the United States walks it off. And the COVID testing. A few items that are essential to our living here in the village. Every day we spit into one of these. All 600 plus athletes had to get to Tokyo. It's time for Tokyo. Let's get after it. The journey full of airport shenanigans including the U.S. women's volleyball team giving their own That's So Raven impressions. But finally, all the athletes making it and ready for the next stop, Olympic Village. 
U.S. Olympian April Ross speaking to Savannah, giving her the inside scoop on living in the village. Tell me about your movements, what you're able to do, what you're able to see. It feels pretty normal. We're allowed to go to the cafeteria whenever we want. We wear gloves. We use a lot of hand sanitizer all the time. We can take buses out to the high performance center, um, to the venue, and it's pretty free flowing. You know, there's lots of guidelines, but um, to be honest, it feels decently normal here in the village. U.S. rower Michelle Schexer echoing April's sentiments. I do feel very comfortable here. It's unfortunate, I think, that it is, um, you know, receiving some of the negative press that it is. But honestly, in the village, I feel safer there than I have in any city in the States in the past 18 months. But there is one thing we keep hearing about. So I've been getting this question over and over again. I've been getting this question a lot. So let's dive into it. Those cardboard beds. Okay, so it is cardboard. Even under here, everything is cardboard. So you might think they're not very sturdy. Let's test it out. <laughs> hey, oh, she's sneezing. So peaceful. Probably the only one who can sleep on the bed. <laughs> U.S. men's volleyball player Eric Shoji showed TikTok a full tour of his dorm room. Let's go. We have a fridge, a microwave, some coffee. Oh my gosh, our trash. This is our little living room, kind of small. And the best part is our balcony view. And Grace Luzak from U.S. Rowing giving her own behind the scenes tour. No Japan tour would be complete without the super tech savvy toilet. And yes, laundry still has to get done, even in the Olympic Village. Yeah, what's happening is I'm doing about 10 people's laundry. The women's gymnastic team choosing not to stay in the village after an alternate member on the team tested positive, but had some fun of their own in a hotel nearby. And we can't forget about the food. Japan is known for their cuisine, and these athletes are digging in. Welcome to dinner. In the Olympic Village, there are two dining halls. There's the main dining hall, and then there's the casual dining hall, which is all Japanese food. So Kavika and I are checking out tonight. Let's see what we got. First up, salmon salad. Yeah. Teriyaki beef, rice ball, slash musubi. And this is okonomiyaki. It's like a savory Japanese pancake. This food is so good. Of course, they are also here to compete. But as they wait for their moment, several attempted the latest viral TikTok challenge, Oreos Pass the Oreo. <laughs> Team USA making the most- I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus for family dinners, family vacations, family anything, for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers. See the expression? Rise and shine. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. 
Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this, or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. A lifetime experience on and off the field. Go Team USA. Go USA. And taking us along for the ride every step of the way. Love seeing all those athletes yeah, behind the scenes. Yeah, that was fun. Of course, you know this nice lady, Savannah Guthrie, uh, helping us with our behind the scenes this special. Is, I tonight. love this show. Yeah, it, it's you know, it's like today at night. You know, kind of like, today after dark. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's getting dangerous. Well, speaking of that, what 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 do you think about doing the show when it's like dark? You know, pitch dark out. I like it. I mean, we're morning people. Sure. But this is fun. I get get used to this. You sleep in, mm -hmm. you know, you take a little nap in the afternoon. It's good. I like it. Do you like it? I do. Although, you know, it's still every now and then I kind of like, okay, wait, what time is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like our hours, but mm -hmm. I, I, but this is a nice change. This is all right. Maybe we'll keep this up when we get back. Uh, what's been your favorite moment so far? Um, you know, I love doing the opening ceremony. I still mm -hmm. loved the, when the drones By the way, were up you in the and air. Mike Tirico were amazing. We had so much fun, and I had never done it before, so that was really cool when they put the drones up in the air, oh, and my. it was like, I've never seen anything like that in mm -hmm. my life. I'm not sure that anything's been done like that. 1,800 drones, and it, it looked never like been planet done Earth. Yeah. It was beautiful. It was truly beautiful. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the things I find kind of interesting is how this dance that goes on. But again, even here with the Olympics, we had that breaking news with the Simone Biles. Yeah. Yeah, what, what was that? Because you, you and Hoda, I mean, Hoda was at the gymnastics center, but you were here kind of honchoing this thing. What was that like? It, you know, it was crazy because we kind of just shifted into breaking news mode, but it was about the Olympics. Mm -hmm. It was literally the last thing anyone would have expected. And right away, I mean, luckily we have, I, I really, we have the best team in the business. We do. They immediately, they kind of blew up the whole rundown that was planned mm -hmm. and started booking live guests. I think we woke up Mike Tirico yep. in the middle of the night. He, he actually, he said he was, he had just poured some bourbon. He was about to come. Down. Well, he seemed totally sober. I know. He, I don't he think had he had drunk. Yeah, I don't he think he had had it. any yet. He didn't have it. And he's such a good sport. He came down. You know, there, we're in the hotel. Our set is right at the hotel, so he's mm -hmm. probably up in his room. He came down. We started getting the gymnastics analysts on, and you know, it was all unfolding on our air. And Hoda was there, right? So she was watching what was happening. And at first, we didn't know. You know, was it a physical injury? Then mm -hmm. we learned it was had to do something with her her mental health. And so it was just we kind of shifted into that mode and. Um, you know, it's pretty extraordinary, and I'm so proud of the other athletes who really stepped up and yeah. rose to the occasion. They're incredible. What is it? You know, when we come to the Olympics, it's a whole different thing because we get to spend time together that we don't normally. Because, look, let's face it, we've got families and all that, but here it's such unad unadulterated us time. It's fun. It's like camp. It's like today's show camp, and it's 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 really special. And we, you know, it's true because when when we're back home, you know, we have our families, mm -hmm. we've got kids at school, and all that stuff. Here, you know, we get to have our meals together. We go on these little adventures together. And even with the pandemic, we've gone on the bus tour. We had Japanese lunch today, yep. which will be on the show this morning. And it's fun, you know. Yeah. It's just different kind of time, and, and not just those of us that you see on camera, but all of our producers, yeah, all of and our crew. crews, and everybody else. Well, look, I know you've got. Uh, we're, we're on the air. Live in 30 seconds. I know. 30 minutes. It's 30 seconds. Oh my God, I gotta go. <laughs> 30 minutes. Yeah, so you got homework out. to do. Yes. All right. Thanks for joining us for a behind the scenes look and today at the Olympic Games. Stay tuned to today all day throughout the day. For more interviews with all your favorite Olympians. Bye bye. Bye. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Hoda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. First off, let's start out with the fact that you're going to be the first class of surfers at the Olympics. I was looking at some home videos of you as like a little girl holding a small trophy. And I thought to myself, I wonder like this, even when you were little, I mean, it was never a possibility even to yeah. think that you could compete at the Olympics. Now it is a possibility and you're the first. Yeah. That must just feel incredible. No, it feels amazing. When I was a little girl, the Olympics wasn't even a, like a possibility. It wasn't even something that I thought about. and. It's been really fun to see how far the sport has grown and progressed in just the time that I've been on tour and been involved with the sport. Um, it's really come so far, and then to have it recognized at an Olympic level and to be a part of it is like such an honor. I'm so excited. <laughs> and you've dedicated literally your life up to this sport to represent Hawaii, and, and I know how much of that is a part of you. It must be also this just tremendous honor. Yes, I'm, of course, honored and proud to be an American and representing the USA, but more specifically Hawaii. Um, we're a really tight knit community and I feel just a connection to so many people here and I feel like I'll be going to the Olympics with all of them with me. Surfers have this like natural connection to the earth, to the environment, to like the natural world. I mean that you have to be sort of one with the waves and understanding weather and wind and all of those things is a part of it. How would you describe sort of your relationship with surfing, what is that relationship? Surfing is one of those really unique sports because you are working with mother nature and there's like this intangible connection that I feel like any surfer has with the ocean because I mean there's sometimes that you're sitting out in the ocean and you don't necessarily even see a set coming but you feel it and you start moving in that direction and then like 20 seconds later there's a wave and that's like, it's almost spiritual in a way. Um, because you have to really trust your intuition and your gut and feel what's around you. And I love it. I think it's really special. Yeah, and you sort of have to build that relationship. I mean, you probably don't have those instincts right away. It probably takes time to yeah. sort of like, like any relationship. You know what I mean? To know like the nuances of someone you've got to spend time, like yeah. personal time. For sure. I mean, it takes years and years of and hours and hours and being in the water and having, you know, experiencing all the different kinds of conditions and then putting it in the memory bank and picking up on that during another day that's very similar, but it's never the same. So yeah, it's, it, it does, definitely takes a lot of time to figure it out. And you never actually ever have it figured out. That's probably the, that's probably <laughs> the most challenging part. Yeah. Is you're like, I think I got this. And then she throws you a curveball and yeah. it's a wave you've never seen. Yes, exactly. Or conditions you totally didn't prepare for. And I think it's a very humbling thing. I love working with the ocean because it's never the same. You have to learn how to adapt and flow. And that's life, right? right. Is that daunting when it comes to competition? I mean, like, if, if you're a skier, you pretty much know the mountain. <laughs> you pretty much know the curves. You know the bends. Like, you know where the, the hard parts are. When you're dealing with the ocean, and especially yeah. in, in Japan, like it's sort of like, well, I guess I'll figure it out, right? And totally. I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things for me is I'm a perfectionist and I'm a control freak. So I like to try to control as much as I can. But then at a certain point, especially when that horn blows and you're out in the water for your heat, you're kind of like, OK, I've done everything I possibly could. And there's only a few things I can control, which is myself and the waves that I pick and how I surf them. But then the rest of it's out of my hands. I have to you know, trust the universe that it's going to work out. And at the end of the day, um, you know, when I've done everything I can and there's just things I can't control, you just have to be like, all right, well, that's that. <laughs> Got to roll with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you think it is about yourself that has allowed you to reach this point? I think there are a lot of factors that have gone into my success or just to where I am today. I think you know, a huge part of that is my support crew. I wouldn't be where I am today without the amazing group of people behind me. That includes my dad as my coach, my wonderful husband, Luke. I have a great team of sponsors behind me that have been there from the very beginning. And just all of my family and my friends, there's been a, you know, just a tremendous amount of love behind me. And I think that's really carried me to where I am today. And what about you? I mean, we know they've been supportive, <laughs> yeah. but what is it about um, Carissa? There's just you that's going to the Olympics, so what, yeah. what is it? 
I don't know. I think that there is definitely that genuine love and that motivation for surfing and just wanting to do my very best in the water. I think that I really want to share a part of myself with people through my surfing and hoping that using that platform I can hopefully make a positive impact on other people. So I think there's definitely that driving force and I feel like it's really empowering for me to you know, set goals and overcome challenges and it's not always been easy, but I think that definitely has made me who I am today. Yeah, and speaking of inspiring, we were on the beach, saw the girls that you're mentoring. What do you think, if you could choose one message for them to walk away from you with, what would you want them to say, Carissa taught me this, what would you want the this to be? I think for me, for, for like that next generation of females, it would just be that you literally can do anything you set your heart and mind to and that each and every one of us has been put on this earth for a unique reason, so to embrace who you are. I think just living authentically is um, super important. And the body image, that's, that's a big part of this, right? It's yeah. It's to just sort of <laughs> accept yourself. For sure. I think there's definitely a lot of different um, messages that I would love to pass on, and, and positive body image and self-confidence is something I definitely love to encourage. I know that I feel like a lot of young women struggle with that or go through that because, I mean, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things going on in our world today, and um, it can be misleading at times. And so I, if I can just encourage girls to stay on your own path and stay true to who you are and know that you are beautiful just the way you are, oh, that would be awesome. Did you go through that journey? Did you struggle with body image? I did, I did. And I'm never gonna say it's perfect. I still look in the mirror sometimes and don't feel that great about myself. But I think there's strength in vulnerability. And so being able to share your story and share your weaknesses, I think that we all have them. So we can, you know, share them. We can come together and be stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Women in surfing is like, it's amazing how they're sort of taking over the sport in some senses. My <laughs> husband, you know, surfed in Hawaii like years ago, and yesterday he was out surfing, and um, after seeing you, he was inspired to go get on the board. Awesome. <laughs> so he, he was out surfing, and he's like, Katie, like when I was out here 10 years ago, it was me and 30 dudes. Yeah. He's like, I was the only guy <laughs> on a board. He's like, it was all women. He's like, and I was like choking up. He's like, I was so excited to see that, like that yeah. the sport has changed its look. I mean, the landscape is different. I'm so stoked to hear that um, because when I was a little girl, it was literally just me and maybe one other person, another woman in the lineup. And now like at my favorite spot on the South Shore, there's like, eight to 10 little girls in the lineup every single day. It's a testament to how much the sport has grown and the WSL, which is the league that I'm a part of, has done a great job, you know, broadcasting it and getting it to more eyes and to, you know, giving the little girls something to strive for. And right. um, I think it's great. What would you say the process, the journey that you've taken to get to this point, what's the most valuable lesson you'd say you've learned? Well, I've been competing on the championship tour for 10 years now, and every year I'm challenged in some different way, and I've sure. learned something new. I think one of the greatest lessons I've learned is how to be resilient. I mean, I didn't have, like, the strongest start to my, my season, and I've always struggled with just rolling with the punches, and if I get knocked down, to get back up and not to tear myself down. And so I think this past year, I kind of just learn how to pick myself up, dust myself off, and then continue on with a smile. And I hope that that will be valuable moving into the Olympics. Have you always been just super happy? <laughs> you seem like you just wake up with a smile on your face. I think I'm naturally a very happy person. I mean, there's a lot to be grateful for every single day, and I live a blessed life. Um, but I'm not gonna set those unrealistic expectations. I definitely have my days where I'm upset, and I cry, and I'm frustrated, and I'm angry, and there's definitely times I've wanted to give up in this journey. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think I just, keep it to a small group of people. Right, keep yeah. that limited. Yeah, I just, yeah, but you just, you sort of emulate like a general just like oh, positivity. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. but you have all, I mean, there's a lot to extract from, from <laughs> all this amazing nature and, and happiness in your surroundings. It seems like you're, thanks. yeah. Thank you. you take all that in. Yeah, and I've also started working with a sports psych, mm. um, which I've found really valuable. And it's helped me to kind of focus on the right things and process things in a positive way and find that balance with life and, and my professional career.
this is, as we were discussing, this is kind of like normal routine for you. Yes. I, I usually wake up early, and then depending on where the surf is good, Dad and I will go and seek it out. Yes. And <laughs> being here, being able to train in your home state, I mean, that's such a luxury, right? Like, it, you don't have to go anywhere. Some people have to travel if you're a skier, if you're a... But with surfing, it's like your backyard. Oh, no, I mean, I'm so grateful I got to grow up in Hawaii uh, for that reason. We have waves all year round and some of the best waves in the world. And so uh, there's really no better training grounds. When you're out there and you're making decisions and you're training, what most often goes through your mind when you're in the waves? Well, there's a lot going on. Um, it, you know, you're dealing with the swell and the weather and, and the fact that like you're never having the same canvas. It's always something different. Obviously, I have like goals and objectives that I talk with my coach, which is usually my dad. On, um, we talk about what, what I'm going to work on maneuver wise. But nature <laughs> must present all these different challenges and you find yourselves in these scenarios. It must be interesting to always be encountering something new. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why I love surfing and I think surfing is so special is you know, you are dealing with mother nature and you're never actually ever gonna be in control. And it's really humbling, you know, you can, the minute you stop paying attention, she's gonna, you make sure you, to put you in your place, you know, so. Right. Um, yeah, I, I love it. And surfing, making its debut this year, how meaningful is that to you? This has been your life. <laughs> this is, you know, your passion, your hobby, your career. But now it's gonna take stage at the Olympics. How does that feel? Oh my gosh, it is so cool that surfing is gonna be a part of the Olympics. To be honest, when I was a little girl, the Olympics wasn't even on my radar. It was not something I even thought of or dreamed of. And I, just being able to see how much the sport has progressed in the time that I have been doing it, it and to the, to the level of the Olympics is just so rewarding. And I'm so excited to be a part of the sport and especially the women's side right now. How comforting are the waves to you? When you're not in them and you're not focused, <laughs> Is this environment sort of at where you're most at peace? Um, you know, I d definitely being in the water is where I feel the most at home, and surfing is where I feel most myself. But my home is in the back of the valley. It's nice to come here for work and then get away. And yeah. this isn't a bad place to work. I mean, not you about, have to work not about somewhere. Office. This isn't a bad <laughs> office space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a rainbow in your office today. I know, it's gorgeous. I feel very blessed. How does it work with your dad as your coach? My dad taught me how to surf when I was five years old, and he's been there with me every step of the way. And of course it gets tricky at times, balancing you know, a coaching-dad relationship, but I think finally at 27, we're finally figuring it out. <laughs> you got the kinks worked out, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the good news is, like, you know, you have a certain honesty with your parents that you might not always have with somebody else. So you can probably yeah. tell them, like, once in a while, like, Dad, you well, know. We've had our fair share of you know, disagreements, disagreements. But um, like you said, the best part about having my dad as, as my coach is that he's going to be the most honest with me and know and he knows my potential um, and he's going to push me like no other person can. And of course, we're going to have our qualms, but we're always going to be able to figure it out. Yeah. So. What's life like leading up to the Olympics? Are you nervous? Are you excited? I mean, what, what are you feeling at this at this point? Well, um, so far, I mean, I'm really excited. This is new. This is all new. I have no expectations. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. 
spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, rise and shine. I have to say congratulations because you're an Olympian now. How does that feel? I'm just confused because I uh, just uh, like a surprise that I, I mean that uh, we are shocked. You're shocked. Yeah. For now I'm in the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Disbelief. Yeah, exactly. So we'll get back to that in a minute then, but if we could go back and if you could tell me a little bit about your story before you came to France. How old were you when you started riding cycling? Uh, when I, wa I was uh, in Iran that I learned cycling, but uh, when I returned to Afghanistan, I didn't know there is a federation of cycling that worked for the women. But uh, I was in 11th class uh, in uh, 2011. I uh, federation of cycling organized a race between uh, a school of girls and I participated in like that. I knew that there is a federation of cycling that works for the women. I participated in the race. After I keep in contact with the federation. Before of cycling, uh, I was the member of uh, basketball team in the school. I like a lot uh, um, sport. I wanted to do the sport and I wanted to find my talent in sport and continue with the national team. I tried volleyball, basketball, taekwondo, <laughs> and also I have a study sport. I, I did a different sports like a ping pong, badminton, a lot of sport. But uh, I found uh, my talent in cycling. And every race, uh, the finish line, it was in the mountain. And I was uh, um, always uh, first position. And I knew that I have talent in uh, cycling. At the beginning, when I found uh, my talent in cycling, I wanted just to improve uh, sportively. I wanted to improve my sport, but then I see th that there's not a lot of girls in cycling. And uh, I see uh, the women who wanted to do cycling, they have a lot of problems. Then my objective it was uh, to normalize, to help uh, for normalizing uh, cycling for the women in Afghanistan. I wanted to... Uh, to show the women, to encourage them, uh, and also to encourage their parents to allow their girls uh, to do cycling, to allow uh, girls to do cycling, because I don't see any difference between uh, women and um, men. Uh, when a uh, man, uh, man can do cycling, why not a uh, woman? And there's uh, no difference. And it was so strange for the people. When I participated in the race, they talk about me. Sometimes uh, they told me, why you uh, wear a scarf? I said, it, it, I like it, I'm comfortable with it. So what do you want people to see when they see you riding a bike? In Afghanistan, they think uh, that it's not good uh, for a girl uh, to wear uh, sportive clothes, to ride bike in the street. They, they never seen that it's strange, they think it's not uh, Beautiful, it, it not looks beautiful. It's better uh, that women stay at home or study, but not cycling, not a sport like cycling. They don't like, they think it's, it's not um, in our culture, in our religion. It's um, something outside of that because of that. Uh, and really it's not uh, like that. And just uh, to, to understand that uh, everyone ha has right to do what they want. I, we have to respect, I respect you, you have to respect me. It's just a question of um, understanding, logic. So when you were first cycling in Afghanistan, did you tell your family? Did you tell everyone, I'm going to go out and ride a bike? My parents, sure, because I didn't never do anything without saying uh, to my parents, my parents always, 
in my parents, uh, uh, every time I wanted to do something, my parents uh, say, you can do it. They had a lot of confidence uh, to me. They, all, and they never uh, say me, no, you cannot do it. It's not good for you. You, you are a girl. It's not good. Uh, they never see me. Uh, they never uh, told me that. They uh, always uh, support me, encourage me. But the other family, like uh, uncle, uh, uh, no, they didn't know, and I don't want it. Uh, they know because uh, after see uh, they know they um, came to my parents. They said uh, that uh, they will create a problem for my parents because of that. I didn't want. But as I was uh, most of the time uh, first position, there was media that wanted to um, to interview with me. Some, I didn't want it, I refused it, but the president of uh, cycling said to me, if you want to continue cycling, you have to do interview. They like it. Uh, it's uh, the only way to normalize really with the media. If you talk with the media, you transfer your message. It's the, uh, the only way you can help uh, the other girls uh, to encourage them. So you had to, you felt you had to speak out yeah. be very public. <laughs> yeah, it, because uh, my coach it was right. It's the only way we can uh, help uh, other girls or mm, because uh, most of the people in Afghanistan, they didn't know that uh, in this security situation, there is a federation of cycling that was for the women mm, like me. Me, I didn't know. And uh, with the media, we can uh, show them, we can encourage. Uh, the women, their parents, uh, because of that I accept it. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. What do you want other women and girls to know about cycling? Freedom and to, to show that the women have a ability to do whatever they want. Can you tell me specifically, if you can, why it's dangerous for girls to ride bikes in Afghanistan? Unfortunately, some people, they think it's their responsibility to stop the girls uh, to do not uh, bike. Uh, all of, I think all of the girls who do cycling in Afghanistan, they had uh, experience that uh, uh, a man, uh, they try to, to push them or to, um, Frappe. To hit them? Yeah, to hit them. And uh, they come out uh, from the window and they they try to push. That's scary. I never know when I when uh, it's arrived to me. I know oh, uh, it's so dangerous. Uh, I heard it's dangerous, but I never know uh, the people can do, really. After that, I never say to my parents because I know see if they know it, they will stop me because they're afraid. If the people can do it, they will do whatever. Because in the street, there's no police, there's no camera. See if do anything. So you would have to ride with boys around the our, girls. Our coach, it was in the car. 
farther away? Yeah, far away. How do you feel inside when you get on a bicycle and you ride? When I am on the bike, I see the nature. I like, I love nature. And also when I, uh, the wind uh, touch my... Uh, Your face? Yeah. It's like uh, I'm alive. It's like a feeling of power. Power. Yeah, that um, it's like something uh, that I cannot uh, really say it in the words. It's hard to describe. Yeah, um, for example, sometimes uh, when I'm so tired, when I don't like life, <laughs> when I do bike, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I say to myself, why uh, I did it before, now I'm okay. It fixes everything. Yeah, exactly. Different person on the bike. Yeah, yeah. This has been a very long journey for you. You've had to leave your own country. Your family has come with you, your parents and siblings. So you've, you've sacrificed a lot. You've been through a lot. What message do you want to send to people about what you've been through? As I said, my objective uh, from the beginning when I started cycling was uh, to normalize, to help uh, for normalizing the cycling in Afghanistan. But when I came in France, I see it's, it's not uh, just Afghanistan that have problem with the girls. Um, even in France, uh, the people, uh, they never see a girl who wear a scarf to Dubai is a strength for them. Now my objective is not just for Afghanistan, it's uh, for all countries. I wanted to show to all these countries that there is no problem without a scarf or with a scarf. It's, they ha all women have right to ride bike and uh, we have to respect them, their choice. And we are not here to judge people that wearing something or to doing something. We have to respect each other and uh, respect our rights and the uh, rights of the, the others. Respect your right to get on a bike and wear a scarf and ride. Yeah, exactly. How do you feel about going to the Olympics? Are you nervous? Yeah, a little bit <laughs> because I will compete. Uh, I have a competition with the best of the world. <laughs> it's not easy. It's really, really difficult. But uh, I'm happy, I'm a part of it. When you started riding a bike in Afghanistan, did you ever think you'd be sitting here in France getting ready to go to the Olympics? Never. As a cyclist? Never, never. It's like a dream. Yeah, it's like a dream that I'm, I think I'm always in the dream. Olympic Games is not uh, just Olympic Games. It's really a famous competition, hard competition. It's uh, every person had not a uh, chance or uh, to participate in the Olympic Games. I think I'm uh, the, I had a lot of chance to be a part of uh, Olympic Games. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs>
Hey everyone, welcome to a special edition of Shop All Day. I'm Yahoo! contributing editor Chassie Post, and this week we're back with something big. The Olympic Games are in full swing, so we're bringing you gold medal worthy products. And these are truly the best of the best and winners in any race. We've got standout fashion and beauty finds, game-changing products for your skin, and items that'll help you cook, clean, and simply make your life better. And see the QR code at the bottom of your screen? You can use your camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. And let's kick it off with my best beauty picks for a podium ready look. Okay, first up we have It's a 10 Miracle Leave-In product. And this little leave-in conditioner, I mean, should win a gold medal for frizz busting. It's perfect for summer humidity, but this little product is a 10-in-1 product. That's why it's called It's a 10. So it doesn't just fight frizz, it also smooths your hair. It also protects against split ends and breakage. It can act as a detangler. It also protects your color. I mean, there's practically nothing that this little guy doesn't do. It is incredibly popular. So next up, I mean, we've got another beauty winner, and this is the NARS blush. And talk about gold medals. This is the number one best-selling blush in the United States. And here's what people love so much about it. It's got this beautiful weightless formula that gives you a really natural glow, that sheer wash of a glow, which is so on trend right now. But you can also build the product to make sort of more of an intense look. I love, you know, products that do double duty. Also, it's got 26 different shades. So this is such a wonderful find. But now let's talk about one of my favorite beauty hacks, and that is the Essence Lash Princess False Lash Waterproof Mascara. And this is the waterproof version of the mega bestseller original Lash Princess by Essence False Lash Mascara. It gives you that false lash effect, and I have to say it really does look like you're wearing falsies. It's waterproof, which is key for summer. I use this brand every single morning. I mean, it makes them longer and more voluminous than mascaras that are, you know, several times the price. So my jaw always drops when I see the price on this one. So now we've talked about beauty. Let's now talk about some great fashion finds, starting with a trend that we have seen everywhere this season, and that is the jumpsuit. Don't get me started on one piece dressing. One and done. I love it that it's so easy, but this jumpsuit is such a big trend right now because it's got the off the shoulder, which feels very flash dance to me and in the best way. This little jumpsuit is also the number one best-selling jumpsuit on Amazon. And here's why people love it so much. It's incredibly comfortable. I mean, from the fabric, it's about half cotton, half spandex. It's got the great waist detail here that you can adjust. It's also incredibly versatile. So, you know, we talked about this little flash dance look that it's such a big trend, right? But you can also wear it like a regular t-shirt. So what that means is this jumpsuit is going to take you pretty much anywhere and everywhere you need to go. So now let's talk about a legging that is never gonna go out of style and has a total cult following. And that is the Align Legging by Lululemon. And I mean, to say that Lululemon, this brand, has a cult following, I think is an understatement. This brand is a national phenomenon and it got famous based on its next level leggings. They are just so incredibly comfortable. They're like wearing a second skin. And you know, people never wanna take them off. Therefore, they don't. This fabric is just so wonderful. It's got a four-way stretch. It also is sweat wicking. 
and it's really breathable. It comes in 16 different colors and patterns, and I really like this feature. It also has six different lengths, which is really key, and also it comes in sizes zero to 20. So next, we all need a dress that we can wear everywhere that will make us feel like we just won the medal, right? And that's what this little dress is. This dress has one of the really big trends of the season, and that is the statement sleeve. So if you take the sleeve away, we've got a great, nice shift dress, right? Perfectly nice. But you add the sleeve, and it really becomes something special, which I love. I mean, I'm always looking for pieces that make me feel really happy. And besides that, I mean, it's super comfortable. It's that great shift silhouette, so it's really easy to wear. And I mean, talk about versatile. It is versatile with a capital V. Because it's V-neck, I mean, you really can wear it anywhere. I mean, you could make this a cover-up if you wore it with flip-flops. But then, I mean, how perfect is this? You know, throwing on a sandal, going to a brunch. It's perfect for wearing to a wedding. And so, last but not least, we have a classic white sneaker, which I like to call the LWS. I mean, the classic white sneaker is probably one of those wardrobe staples that can be a foundation of your summer uniform. And this little Superga Kotu sneaker is the OG of the fashion sneaker. And what we love so much about it is, yes, it is a classic. It goes with every single thing in your wardrobe. But you know what it does? It also sort of transforms things in your wardrobe. You pair the little LWS with it and suddenly, you know, outfits that you've had in your closet for years feel sporty and new. You really can wear them absolutely everywhere. So let's run through these products one more time. And you can scan the QR code on your screen to get instant access or tech shop to the number below to see all the products on the show. We've got the It's a 10 Miracle Leave-In product, the NARS blush, the Essence Waterproof Mascara, the Off the Shoulder Jumpsuit, the Lululemon High Rise Leggings, the Bell Sleeve Shift Dress, and lastly, the Superga Kotu Sneakers. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, Adriana Brock is talking to dermatologist Dr. Elise Love about podium-worthy summer skin. Stay tuned. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! everybody welcome to today future's looking yeah bright. are you ready we're gonna do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines so crucial for reopening america a big day around here a very special naturalization ceremony many of them doctors nurses other essential workers if you are a nurse thank you spring has sprung guys and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises yes this is the face of excitement <laughs> celebrating earth day let's change the world love it
good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, rise and shine. Hey guys, I'm Adriana Brock, Shop Today Editorial Director. And we're back with Influencer Trends, where each week I chat with industry insiders, celebrity trendsetters, and the buzziest influencers on the internet. Today, we've got a special guest who's gonna be talking to us about a really important topic that deserves its own gold medal, skincare. New York City dermatologist, Dr. Elise Love is joining us to give us her best tips and tricks to help you keep your skincare in check this summer. And don't forget, you can use the camera on your smartphone to scan the QR code at the bottom of your screen and shop any of the products we're about to feature. Hey, Elise, how are you? I'm doing so well. How are you doing? I'm great. I am so excited for this topic because it's one of my personal favorite topics to talk about, skincare. Same, same. You're very vocal about your own skincare journey and how it inspired you to actually become a dermatologist. I would love to learn more about how that happened and how that shaped your sort of philosophy on dermatology. Yeah, like so many other individuals in this country and the world, when I entered about the age of 14, I started to develop really intense acne, like the type of acne that's painful, that hurts, that lasts forever, and the type of acne that really affected my self-confidence to the point where over the next few years of battling with the acne, I started to sit in the back of the classroom. I didn't talk as much. I was super quiet. And it really took me finding a dermatologist that worked with me to develop a routine that worked for my skin. And once my skin was clear, I realized the huge impact that what your skin looks like has on your quality of life and how you interact with the world. And so for me, I'm always keeping that in mind when I see my patients in the office is how is this routine going to change the way that they interact with the world? That's great to hear like that passion behind that because I feel like a lot of times people think it's like a one size fits all, but it's really personal to everybody. Definitely. Skincare, it can be a little overwhelming because there's so many people giving so many recommendations, but there's something that's right for you. Awesome. And speaking of skincare, I know every dermatologist I've ever interviewed always talks about like the foundation of a good routine is sunscreen and it's yes. so important to use it every single day whether it's summer or fall or winter so you have one of your favorite picks right here yes i do and it's uncapped because i've been using it so this is one of my favorites it's a newer sunscreen that's come out and it's by la roche posay and the reason i love this is because the biggest complaint about sunscreen has been that it doesn't feel good on the skin but this is a mineral-based sunscreen that is formulated with hyaluronic acid and it's really kind of designed to be used by everyone every skin type without that thick white cast so you get a good broad spectrum protection without feeling like it's heavy on your skin it actually makes your skin look a little bit more hydrated yeah i feel like one of the biggest issues with finding the perfect sunscreen is one that you're actually going to use so this yes, one checks exactly. all the boxes this one checks all of the boxes. And with sunscreen, you just have to explore, 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 but this is definitely one worth giving a try. Awesome. And then moving on to an anti-aging product that you swear by yes. and recommend that's not gonna break the bank. And we just wanna <laughs> let everyone know out there that before you start a new skincare routine, it's always important to touch base with a dermatologist, right? Because some people could be yes, a little sensitive yes, to retinol, especially. Exactly. Retinol is my like, favorite skincare ingredient because it really does everything. So in the way that SPF protects you from a lot of things that can be damaging to the skin, retinol really helps to kind of reverse and soften a lot of the things that we would like to have softened and reversed. And so this one by CeraVe is a really great option because exactly what you just said, sometimes retinol, for all of the great things it does, it can be a little irritating. And summer's actually surprisingly the best time to try to add a retinol to your routine because it's not super dry. And so it's gonna be easier for you to tolerate this product in the summertime than it would be to add it in the winter time. That is so interesting. I would never think that you would use a retinol more during the summer, especially because yeah. sometimes there's some sensitivity that comes with the sun. 
Exactly. You always yeah. want to pair it with an SPF because it can make you a little bit more sensitive to the sun, but your skin tends to be less sensitive in general to in active ingredients in the summer because it's more humid outside. It's warmer outside. You can just tolerate a lot more. You still want to start it slowly. A pea size amount is enough for the entire face and start it like two to three times a week and slowly add it into the routine. We always want to know what a dermatologist actually yeah. uses on their skin. And yeah. you have two products that I think you could find them at the drugstore. Yeah. And so these are two of my absolute favorites. One is the Neutrogena. This is the oil free acne wash. Specifically, I love the pink grapefruit one because it just okay. smells so good and it's great for starting your morning. But this has salicylic acid in it. So if you notice that your skin is starting to become oilier or a little bit more textured in the summertime just because of that humidity, this is a great face wash to add into your routine just to get a little exfoliation and decrease the oiliness of the skin. They also make Ooh. a body wash for the same reason. Yeah, actually, I use this one at home. And then the last one is also by La Roche-Posay. This is their Tularine Double Repair Face Moisturizer. I love this moisturizer so much. I have it with SPF and without SPF. And so I like having just a moisturizer that has SPF in it because I know that I'm getting my SPF within my routine, but I'm not having like an extra layer um, during like the Monday through Friday days where I'm mostly at work. Oh, that's such a great idea. It's almost like the two in one and you're out the door. Exactly, so there are yeah. no excuses. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for sharing all these summer skincare tips and all these great products. Thank you for having me. This is so of much course. fun. Of course, thank you. And this is a gold medal show. So we've got a couple of bonus products curated by our Shop Today editors. These are the products that Today.com beauty lovers cannot get enough of. This first one is the Olay Regenerous Cream. This anti-aging cream has been a customer favorite for decades. So what makes it so great? It's actually packed with vitamin B3, which is as much as 2,500 cups of kale, which is gonna help strengthen your skin's moisture barrier. Another one that we have here is this bio oil. It is amazing. You can get it at the drugstore. It's an award-winning body oil that's been around for over 30 years. And you can use it from head to toe to moisturize your skin, but it's actually best known for reducing the look of uneven skin tone, scars, and stretch marks. So most beauty products are made with water, mostly water, which evaporates. It doesn't really moisturize. This product is only 3% water, so it's chock full of the good stuff that actually works. Oils, vitamin A and E, which instantly absorb into the skin to deliver those moisturizing results. All right, let's go through the products one more time. And if you saw anything here that you're interested in purchasing, simply text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we've shared on today's show. We have the La Roche-Posay Broad Spectrum Sunscreen, the CeraVe Retinol, the La Roche-Posay Double Repair and UV Moisturizer, the Neutrogena Salicylic Acid Cleanser, the Olay Regenerous Cream, the Bio Oil Skincare Oil, and just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And up next, Jen Fallick is bringing you gold medal worthy Better Basics. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What should we watch for to find out whether this Geneva summit was worth it? What would it take for you to support this bipartisan infrastructure deal? What are the issues that the party stands for? That seems to be the missing piece here. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. 
for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yeah. Cheers to you. Cheers. New meaning, Hendy the expression, rise and shine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey everyone, welcome back to Shop All Day. I'm Jen Fallick and we are going for the gold. Let's start off with my list of better basics. And we are kicking it off with something to help you get a gold medal shine on your jewelry. This is the Diamond Dazzle Stick. I absolutely love this for many reasons. First and foremost, it is so easy to travel with. All you gotta do is snap off the cap and within seconds, your jewelry will be sparkling like brand new. It's a bestseller for good reason. The formula is amazing. The way that you apply it is so simple. You simply kind of click it up, you dab it. It gets in all the nooks and crannies. If you've got a friend who's recently engaged, this is maybe one of the best gifts that you can give them. Again, easy to travel with, great formula, and I just love the flow through brush. This gets it done. Now on to a huge cleaning hack that actually went viral on social media. Forget your basic cleansers. The pink stuff is the ultimate better basic for cleaning anything and everything in your house. This was actually initially created in 1938, so it's been around for a while. The pink stuff is a paste, so all you do is you take the paste and you just massage it onto any surface that you need to clean. You can use this on a saucepan, you can use it on your grill, countertops, simply just wipe it down with the cloth. When you're done, it doesn't leave a residue. You just want to give it like a quick swipe with a dry cloth and anything and everything will look like new. I actually went nuts this past weekend cleaning all of my fixtures in my bathroom. And now I feel like I have a whole new bathroom. Easy to use, versatile, and how fun is this packaging? Something good to know too, it's a vegan formula. It has a lot of natural ingredients in there. So even then it was way ahead of its time. So now we've gone to the pink stuff. I'm gonna show you the blue goo. This cleaning gel is amazing. Initially, the Tycob gel was really used for trucks to get all the dust out of the vents or those hard to reach places that you need to clean in a car. But it has found new life as the best way to clean out keyboards on all your devices at home. First of all, my kids were very excited because it looks kind of like slime, which they're obsessed with. And this one smells a lot better though. This is a lavender scent. You take the goo and you just press it into anything that you need to clean. It has a lot of natural ingredients in there and you can reuse it over and over again. It actually signals to you when it's time to bring in a new one because the color will turn dark. There's different colors that all have different fragrances. Way better than, again, your basic duster. Big upgrade. So now that we've cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, let's have some, some relaxation time, some tech innovations that are gonna help make your life a little more chill. First up, personally, the best pandemic purchase that I made was this. This is the Theragun Mini Sports Massager. It looks like it's little, but it packs so much power. You know, Theragun really is like the gold standard in home massage devices. And this is the most upgraded version that they have. It's ergonomic, easy to hold. You have three different speeds. It is an investment that is well worth making. You can sort of see, I'll give it like this, and you can just get into everywhere. So bad. Something else that I really enjoy about this one is that the Theragun Mini happens to be the quietest of all the Theraguns. It's small, portable, and one full charge is going to last you 150 minutes, which is huge because with a lot of devices like these, I find that you kind of use it, you get one side of your neck done, and then you need to charge it before you get to the other. So 150 minutes of usage with each full charge. Portable, easy to use, it is amazing. Like a professional massage literally at your fingertips. Next up, this is an item that will absolutely probably save me time, may save my marriage, will save my kids from screaming at me because the main reason that I am late 
pretty much 90% of the time is because I cannot find my phone, my wallet, or my car keys, which is why people are obsessed with the Tile. The Tile is a Bluetooth tracker and item locator, and there's different versions you can attach to different things. So what's great is you can take a Tile tag, you can put it around your keys. People even use this on their dog's collars. You can take the little stickers, which are these little guys, put this on your remote control, put it on a phone as well, and there's this little slim right here that you can slip into your wallet. So when you're at home, within like 150 to 200 square feet, you can just find the device by sound. So you can search for it, it'll make a noise, you can find it from the ringtone. But it's also Bluetooth enabled. So if you're out and about, it also attaches through an app. So you can go into the very secure anonymous Tile app and find the last location of your device if you happen to take it out of the house and then you can't find it. So again, there's all these different versions depending on what you need. Now let's head into the kitchen. We've got some amazing better basics that are gonna upgrade every experience you have in the kitchen, starting with the Dash egg cooker. So first of all, you guys, how cute are these? They come in such fun colors. They're really small, lightweight, easy to store. I love hard boiled eggs. My daughter likes soft boiled eggs. My husband likes omelets. It's a whole like short order cook situation in my house in the morning. What's great about this dash cooker is this one holds six eggs in there. You have different settings, whether you want to do hard boiled, soft boiled, medium boiled. You can even put in the little accessories to make omelets or to poach your eggs. The settings are there. It monitors the duckness of your eggs for you. And I do love that everything stores right inside. It's one less thing to take up extra storage space in my pantry. The next big essential that we have in our house is a smoothie maker. My kids are obsessed with smoothies, so this is the Ninja XL blender. This has all the power that you need to absolutely like pulverize ice, veggies, fruits, make amazing smoothies, and make enough of it that everyone in the family can have some, and you can have some leftover. I put it in popsicle molds to enjoy the next day. But this is a bestseller for a reason. People love this as the gold standard for really making the best smoothies out there. Highly recommend this one. Okay, so lastly, we're going into the pantry for two better basics that upgrade the most simple dishes. First up, Mike's Hot Honey. I use this on everything. I mean, even my kids will eat Brussels sprouts when we drizzle hot honey on top. It's a blend of honey, a little bit of vinegar, and chili pepper. It's not mild, but it's not wild. So it's somewhere in between. It's spicy enough that even my 10 year olds can enjoy it. And it just makes everything so much better. It's sweet, it's savory, it's all the things. And it upgrades like the most boring thing you could ever make suddenly becomes gourmet. I also give these as hostess gifts a lot. Great packaging too, so it's very gift friendly. And again, put it on everything. Every night I have tea. I put this in, it makes the tea both sweet and savory at the same time. So Mike's Hot Honey, you guys, if you wanna upgrade your basics, this is the thing to add. Another better basic that my pantry always has on hand is Truff. The Truff Hot Sauce Trio is amazing, right? Truff somehow managed to make like hot sauce into this like sexy, cool thing that you need to have. The packaging got me and then we started using it and now we don't really use anything else. It's all natural ingredients. You get a little bit of white truffle in there and the white truffle version. There's one that's a little bit sweeter and not as spicy and then the original, which gives you a really great kick. Use it on wings, use it as a dipping sauce, use it as a marinade. There's so many uses for this. And again, as a gift, the three pack is great, but I also always love to have them on hand. There's nothing more basic than just throwing some pasta on for dinner, but you make it a much better basic when you add the truff pasta sauce on there. And what I love too is that it has a really nice consistency, so it never waters down your pasta dish. Instead, it just enhances the flavor. So let's go through these one more time. You can use the QR code to get instant access to these products. We've got the Diamond Dazzle Stick, the Pink Stuff, Thai Carve Cleaning Goo, the Theragun Mini Sports Massager, the Tile Bluetooth Tracker, the Dash Egg Cooker, the Ninja Blender, Mike's Hot Honey, Truff Variety Pack, and Truff Pasta Sauce. So that's it for Better Basics and a wrap on our show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and tune in again next week for more Shop All Day. Mom? 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 A big idea finally 
come to light. How does this feel? I mean, just a year ago, this was all just a dream. Yeah, it's very surreal that, you know, th this is mine. <laughs> that, you know, I mean, this is your corn. Yeah. Here on 39 acres of land in St. Helena, South Carolina, Chef Adrian Lipscomb is creating a sanctuary for black farmers. The welcoming center yeah. is over there. Right. Where they can grow okay. their own produce and learn about the history of an industry that currently is less than 2% black. We were cooking as slaves, as the cooks in these kitchens. We want to recreate those kitchens. We want to celebrate, but also explain to others and to the public. We want the community to come to this land. We want them to be able to come celebrate on this land. Opening up a new world of possibility that all started with a mystery check in the mail for $100. So you did not know personally no. the person who put this check in the mail to you? No, no. Didn't know this person. Her project is called 40 Acres and a Mule, a reference to the short-lived attempt at reparations that gave former slaves land after the Civil War, only to be rescinded after Lincoln's assassination. It started with the special field order number 15 by General Sherman to give 40 acres and a mule to the slaves that were released from the Civil War that were following him. And the question he asked is, what do you want? And one of them stood up and said, land. How does Juneteenth and the significance of Juneteenth for you connect to this project? Juneteenth has always been celebrated with me and my family. 1865 is just a, a significant year. You already have freed slaves in January of 1865, but you still don't have the free slaves of Texas, not until June 18th of 1865. By the next day, they're celebrating and they're saying, we are free, we can celebrate. And what is so interesting is that slaves weren't allowed to be in big groups. So a lot of those leaders came together and they bought land where they would go and celebrate Juneteenth. And food was a huge portion of this. The celebration of freedom. The celebration of freedom, you're right. Which is why Lipscomb, a mother of four who owns Uptown Cafe and Bakery in La Crosse, Wisconsin, decided to start her project here in South Carolina. A lot of history right there a land uh, slaves were here slaves were here with deep roots and african ancestry land is huge land brings identity land brings community land brings freedom it allows us to navigate in this world to create our history to respect our history but also bring forth our future Lipscomb was able to raise more than $150,000 in less than a year through a GoFundMe page and with the support of celebrity chefs like Mashama Bailey and David Thomas. As an African-American chef, I am really interested in reclaiming the narrative where, where the food of this country started. Together, they're fixing up something special ahead of this Juneteenth, celebrating on their land in the best way they know how. Some of the best chefs in America yeah. are around this table. Helping one entrepreneur fulfill a promise from generations ago. Left the hands and made this food. <laughs> for generations to come. Amen. I see. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this? Or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. 
talent and perseverance inspiring America. I've been preparing for a moment like this for my whole life. I have lots of songs and lots of stuff to share. I want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity. So many reasons to cheer for that young lady. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Food in a way unlocks a lot of stories. It's this emotional connection that we get through eating that food that is really irreplaceable. My name is Chitra Agarwal. I'm the co-founder at Brooklyn Deli, where we make sauces and condiments inspired by my family's recipes from India. My name is Katevi, and I'm the chef and owner of Dumpling Club, a weekly subscription service that features a rotating menu of dumplings and Asian dishes. I started Brooklyn Deli in 2014. Our first products at Brooklyn Deli were my achars, which are a staple Indian condiment. They're kind of like this spicy, sour, a little bit sweet. So you add just a little bit and it kind of just makes the dish like amazing. I developed a lot of the recipes for achar using what I was getting in my farm share. So I was making achar from heirloom tomatoes, garlic, gooseberries. I wouldn't say that it's authentic Indian food. It's very much inspired by my heritage, but it's authentic to me. My grandfather comes from a region in northern China that, that specializes in dumplings. And to him, dumplings were the perfect food, the best food. I use all sorts of influences in the dumplings. For example, influences from my husband's Austrian side. That's not traditionally how dumplings would be made. I'm learning to be really comfortable with that. In the beginning, I felt like that wasn't truly authentic but I actually now feel that that's very authentic to me and my experience. A labor of love learned from generations before them. The pleating sort of represents on the outside the amount of care that's been put into this food. Whenever we made them as a family, seeing the pleats that my mom or that my grandfather added to the dumplings would remind me that they were the ones who prepared this food for me. father's mother, we were just very close. I can still remember the food that she would give me. I can still taste it. They're kind of like food memories from when I was really young, and those continued on as I visited her every year in India. Every trip, we would be in the kitchen. Growing up, we didn't have regular access to Asian groceries, but I learned about the importance of food from my mom. She would use spaghetti whenever she was making stir-fried noodles. Her creativity, that creative spirit that she had when it came to replicating her home food through whatever ingredients that she had on hand, that's what I feel really inspired by. Both women left stable jobs for their culinary careers. It was a really scary time because, I mean, I had been working for over a decade in positions where I had benefits, I had an ongoing salary that I could count on. I left Google in the fall of 2019, and already that year I was starting to make dumplings, send them around to friends and family, and when I decided to really start in earnest was in February 2020, conveniently one month before the pandemic hit and everything shut down. I didn't have a steady job or an income at that time and whenever I had a spare moment, I'd fold dumplings and then I would stay up all hours editing footage and putting it up on Instagram and we were just trying to survive. Despite the pandemic, their businesses not only survived, but thrived our public sales tend to sell out within a few minutes. One time it sold out in less than a minute. For us, it's been great because more people want to try the flavors that we're putting out there and want to learn more about Indian food and culture. Everything that I really learned how to make, I learned from different family members. So I feel like in some sense, the Brooklyn Deli recipes also are a way for our family recipes to kind of live on. When my parents came to the States, they really came here with nothing. 
And I'm super cognizant of that now that it's a huge privilege to be able to, to do what I love, to go after what I love. And that has come from years of sacrifice and hard work from my parents. And knowing that, I want to take that privilege and make sure that I do something really positive with it. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Good evening tonight from Geneva, just hours away from his historic summit. Over 16,000 unaccompanied children tonight in custody. What's victory look like in this? Or what does improvement look like? It's going to be a challenge to meet that 70% goal. Why is it so challenging? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Tonight, we're on the scene as the urgent search for survivors is underway after the deadly collapse of a high-rise building. Buildings don't fall down in America like this. The Delta variant. What does this mean for people who are fully vaccinated? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. there was one thing that I wanted people to take away from our work, it is that black people, black histories and stories are important and they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Whether we're discussing politics, if we're talking about arts and culture, Americana, we are Americana. I just think it's really, really important that black people are centered in conversations about where we are in this moment and where this country is and where we have been. My name is Kiana Stewart, and I'm the co-founder of Black Market Vintage. And my name is Jenna Handy, and I'm co-founder of Black Market Vintage. Black Market Vintage is a Brooklyn, New York-based antique concept shop. The owners travel, collect, and sell items that represent the richness of Black history. We're both from Brooklyn, and we grew up 600 feet from one another and did not meet until we were adults, mm -hmm. which is wild. In terms of how we grew up, I think just a typical Brooklyn, you know, childhood of going to the corner store, playing double dutch outside. So we met at Rutgers University. I don't necessarily know that there was a moment that we knew that we were supposed to be more than friends. I was really intrigued by Jana when I first met her and it felt like I had known her I mean, a lifetime. There was a twinkle in her eye that almost I understood what it meant like. <laughs> and so there was something that we were able to see beyond where we were to see kind of where we could end up. So I grew up going to vintage shops, thrift stores, stopping on the side of the road. You name it, my mom was stopping the car mm -hmm. and bringing stuff into the car to bring home. In these shops, Kiana and her mother rarely saw people that looked like them or items that represented their history. So going into antique shops and like, we are the only black people in the spaces. There's no black art on the walls. There's barely any black literature. Over time, Jana joined Kiana on the quest to fill this void. They began traveling the country, collecting black art, black music, black literature, civil rights memorabilia. And then in 2014, started selling it from their stoop 
and at flea markets. When we first started out, it, it was 100% a hobby. And, you know, weekend markets, getting up, setting up as vendors. And it, we really didn't see that there was a need to shift until the community kind of told us that. Demand for their products and interest in the history behind the items was so great, the next step was creating a consistent presence. We kept outgrowing ourselves to the point that we needed to, to you know, create the infrastructure to then go from a hobby to an online store to then a physical shop. In November 2019, they opened their brick and mortar shop. Our public opening, that really was like a full circle moment, you know, it was like, bed is getting this gem of a business and folks who are community oriented, a place, you know, that folks can meet and gather and see themselves. There were folks in this space all day. There are just so many aspects of this work that we didn't necessarily imagine at the very beginning. I did not envision that Lena Waithe would say after Queen and Slim, like, we need rap gifts for the whole crew. Thank you for this journey, no matter how it ends. Here's the beautiful thing about what they're doing, too, is like, they are saying about our magazines, old books, old t-shirts, our tchotchkes, our buttons, that they are worthy of being kept. Other customers echo that significance. What I love most is that people are starting to redefine how important it is to have these artifacts, to have this history to know this history. Every sale that they make is a whole learning experience. Black artifacts historically have always served as a function like in our communities and in our uh, societies at large. They, um, they tell a story, they say that we were here, we lived here, our lives were important. Um, we were names, we were a culture, we were a family. Of the thousands of items they've sourced, Kiana and Jana showed us some of their oldest items. There were a few NAACP signs from a float from a parade. Something else that I can think off the top is a fugitive slave notice from, I wanna say the early to mid 1800s. Black people have been collecting and doing this kind of work for as long as we've lived, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen a shop that exists in this kind of way. We were open for about four months before closing for COVID. We were adjusting to a new schedule, to new financial obligations, now having different kinds of overhead with the physical space. It's just a time of great uncertainty. So we're still very much so in this like really strange, odd, traumatic place. Now we're kind of redirecting it back to online. And so there's been those pieces of it when it comes to the logistics of the business side. Um, but really we've been able to adapt and overcome in, in some substantial ways. I really want the legacy of Black Market Vintage to be that Black people are thought about and considered from the very beginning and are not an afterthought, but that a whole community and a whole business is conceptualized and put into action with Black people at the center. And I really think it's important that other folks do the same. Like the material is very important. The people and the stories that are embedded and imbued in those objects are just as important. And that's, uh, that's the ethos of our work. Our business says there's a place for you. Mm -hmm. There's a place for grandma's things. There's a place for grandpa's things, a place for your things. To then recirculate them throughout the community and make them accessible because they are important. Mm -hmm. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, rise and shine. Good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We are going to be cheering you on all the way. Oda is going to renew their vows right here. Yes. Cheers to you. Cheers. the expression, rise and shine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. 
for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Every business is closing down. I have to do whatever I can do to celebrate and showcase my heritage, my proud ancient black Jewish culture, and eventually touch different people through my food. My name is BJ Barhani, the owner of Tion Cafe, Ethiopian Mediterranean restaurant in Harlem, New York. The cuisine we serve at Tion Cafe is a homage to my diverse identity and culture that I was brought up in. It's uh, celebrating my Jewish, my Ethiopian, and the New Yorker aspect of, of me. As an immigrant, it's very important to empower people within the community and really to help them pave the way and make it here in New York. I have great respect for new immigrants. They just want to go and contribute to the community where they live. We opened Tion Cafe in 2014. It's an establishment where you can nourish your body and soul. It's a place for healthy eating, a community gathering, and making a connection with different people. It's a place where you can come and listen to great music. This used to be the famous Jimmy's Chicken Shack, where in the high day of the Harlem Renaissance, musicians such as Art Tatum, uh, Hazel Scott, or Billie Holiday used to perform here. Different people were working here, such as uh, Charlie Parker, Red Fox, the comedian, and the leader, uh, Malcolm X, the live music, and the art shows from local artists, local musicians. That's how I honor the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance. I was born in 1976, Tigray, Ethiopia. Growing up in Tigray, it's very happy childhood uh, memories. It was a surreal, beautiful country, delicious food that early mornings, I recall my mom roasting the delicious coffee in the house. I left Ethiopia when I was four years old and then lived in Sudan for a couple of years. We never really said that we are Jews, we had to hide our religion. We didn't want to create any uh, problem or trouble. Arriving eventually to Israel was a dream come true. We integrated to the society, and in some point in my life, I wanted to live uh, in a kibbutz. A kibbutz is a cooperative way of living, a sharing in a community. Growing up in Israel was a place where I was exposed to a lot of diversity within the Jewish cuisine. Going to my Georgian or Gruzni friends and eating some delicious food, or going to my Yemenite friend and eating some Malawak and Jachnun. So I grew up really immersed on all those diversities, uh, cuisines, and that kind of, uh, you know, it molded me to appreciate food from all over the world. In the year of 2000, I came to New York when I was 21. I came to New York by myself, didn't know anybody. I just took a backpack and came here. My parents did come to New York for a couple of times. Loved it. The plan was for her, actually, when I decided to open Sion Cafe, to come and help me here and guide me. Unfortunately, uh, my mom passed away about uh, four years ago from cancer. She is a, a great 
influence to the person who I am today. And her picture is right there in honor of her. And I will do, you know, whatever I can to make sure that I continue that uh, rich legacy that my mom engraved in me. I have two kids. Alam is my elder daughter. She is uh, 15 years old. And my son, Berhan, is 11 years old. They take part in helping, if necessary, here at the cafe. Ethiopian food is what I grew up on. Like the spices, the flavors, everything. It just like, it's so much. Like it brings me back to my childhood. And I love introducing it to my friends. And they actually love it as well. So it's really exciting. The menu is a showcase of the different people, different cuisines, different flavors that I encounter throughout my life. You won't find anywhere in a menu where you have shakshuka together with the Ethiopian veggie combo, or malawa, or jollof rice with doro tips. I never ate jollof rice before when growing up in Israel, but coming here to New York and having employees from Nigeria open me to that beautiful cuisine. In the neighborhood, it's a lot of fast food. It was very important for me to bring something wholesome that is nourishing the community, is a healthy option. There is a high rate diabetes, obesity, and I wanted to address those issues by opening a venue where we can provide locally sourced uh, vegetables, organic ingredients. We make fresh injera here every day, about 100 a day. It's made out of F, the ancient grain that it basically has a lot of minerals and vitamins. 2020 for us at Zion Cafe started very well. January was great, uh, February was good, and then uh, all of a sudden, March come in and the pandemic hit New York. The unprecedented changes took effect in two of the nation's largest and most densely populated metro areas. Much of New York and San Francisco now shut down. And it was a, a disaster. We started feeding frontline workers or anybody in need towards the end of March and then mid-April. For the security of everybody, for the safety of my employees and myself, we really decided to close, shut down everything. The city providing this opportunity to open a roadside or sidewalk cafe, it's of course, uh, it's very helpful rather than, you know, depending only on takeout or deliveries. From 30, 40 tables, now you have about 10 tables. It's a big difference in terms of revenue intake. Uh, but are we going to give up? No, we're going to still keep fighting and make sure we are feeding our community. Waves of peaceful protests marched on bigger than ever before. After the killing of George Floyd, for me as a black mother, it was very troubling to see of a murder of an innocent man. Uh, a lot of people wanted to support minority-owned businesses, black-owned businesses, and that helped. Through this pandemic, they've really made an effort and a real obvious commitment to this community, not just by sharing their wonderful gift of food and culture, but by being very open-minded and inviting people like me and my friends and artists to come and share our gifts and our talents. Harlem is home. Harlem is the mecca of black culture. Harlem is part of me. In this pandemic time, hard time, if we can uplift people's spirit, if it's music, healthy food, our job is done. 
What's going on to all of you watching today all day? I'm here along with the Savannah Guthrie. I was just doing a mime or something. I don't know what's happening. Well, you've been here for a while. <laughs> uh, you're watching today in 30, by the way. And we're so happy you're here. As our viewers know, we just have 30 minutes. We're just going to try to condense everything you missed on today in four hours. We can't waste any time. Let's get to it, Craig. What's all up? right. We're going to start with a report from Hoda. Of course, you spent the day at the gymnastics center.